Good day and welcome to the third lecture in the Information Technology Importance and Strategic Planning course. I'd like to uh, welcome you all back. Uh, today we're going to spend a little bit talking about uh, a couple of um, uh, areas. One is information technology and the impact it's had on the uh, design of the work and workplace. Uh, and then secondly, also around the business processes and how to think about the implications for information technology. Uh, I thought it would be uh, interesting to start out by um, uh, referencing an article I read uh, a little bit ago around where information technology, in particular automation of uh, knowledge workers, I mentioned in the last lecture, robotic process automation, uh, what the implications will be um, for workers and in particular the workplace. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is a quote out of that article. The uh, uh, URL is, uh, is uh, seen below, so if you'd like to take a look at it, please do so. Uh, but maybe it won't be visible to the eye, but robots may have taken the place where people currently toil to keep the Vegas machine humming. About 65% of all jobs in Vegas are susceptible to automation by 2035 a bigger share than in any other part of the country. Across the United States, 55% or more of jobs in almost all metropolitan areas face this same scenario. And this really has to do with how these software robots are uh, creeping their way into the traditional knowledge worker workspace. And it isn't just uh, process automation, but it's also uh, how workers actually work um, with one another uh, in a highly distributed environment and how technology has enabled that for good and in some cases uh, not necessarily good uh, for workers or for the organization. So we'll spend a little bit of time today talking about uh, some of those factors. So let me start out with this. I, I called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, IT for... Um, all sorts of good reasons, has uh, created new types of work for the workforce. It's enabled uh, new ways uh, to do traditional work, and uh, it supports, in many new ways, uh, the way we manage people. Now, it has challenged traditional work um, in terms of the way the work is done, uh, how we communicate with one another, how decision-making takes place, and collaboration. And as you think about this, uh, and you look at the graphic on the uh, right-hand side of the uh, slide, you'll see that there's the what it is that we do. And uh, this, this is some cases remain relatively the same, but the skill set around that has changed primarily because of the underpinnings of the technology that's being used. Um, who is doing the work has changed. Uh, it, it, it may be groups of individuals, it could be individuals, and as we talk about with robotic process automation, it may be individuals no longer. Maybe individual software-based robots. Where the work is performed has changed. Um, traditionally, the workplace was the place you went to work. Uh, I learned uh, back in 1993 when I had a, uh, a superior come up to me and say, hey, let's go to your office, and I made the comment, um, I don't. I don't have an office. I. Uh, I'm actually on the floor, meaning I was in a cubicle. And he said, "Can you get your work done there?" And I said, "Yes." And his answer back to me was, "Well, then you have an office." Uh, what was really telling about that is this concept of an office, or a location where you get your work done, is not as constrained today in the technology-enabled environment as it used to be. Um, people work in all sorts of places. Uh, in fact, in some cases, it's become fodder for com commercials, the one where the individuals are having a, a teleconference, video conference with their boss, and uh, the backdrop falls down, and it turns out they're on the golf course. Uh, and then when they go to destroy the laptop, uh, it turns out that the boss can still hear them. Uh, so this whole thing around how technology has changed um, what the workplace is um, has some pretty significant ramifications around the where work gets done anymore, as well as who does the work. And then the when is, um, is also a very, uh, a very big uh, teller of, of how things have changed. I know that uh, 
Um, in my particular case, I am always on. Um, being responsible for a large IT organization uh, that is expected to deliver service and capabilities 7 by 24, not just to the workforce, but to uh, customers, consumers, and other stakeholders that we connect with and operate with. Uh, I can receive information around things going on in production, uh, good or bad, um, at all hours. And uh, it's bred an entire industry around this as well. We'll talk at some point uh, down the road about cybersecurity. And in, in my particular case, uh, we use a, uh, an app called Tiger Text, which allows uh, information to be securely transmitted in a message, uh, not an SMS, but more like an iMessage um, experience, but it's done securely um, so that uh, um, folks don't have an easy way to identify if, for instance, you're having a specific kind of production problem or if you're sharing sensitive information. Um, but that whole issue of the when uh, work is getting performed uh, has turned into 7 by 24. And then obviously um, how it gets done has changed radically because of the technology. Uh, teams will interact through collaborative tools, uh, whether it's uh, wiki pages or uh, SharePoint sites or collaborative whiteboard space um, inside of some form of a, a collaborative uh, video-based uh, capability like a WebEx, for instance. Um, I've got some uh, really, uh, really interesting experiences in the workplace using WebEx where the, the Lead, the meeting organizer is not the one who is currently controlling what's being presented. It's being presented by someone else, and and it's this it's this how do you how do you think about technology and and who's got the pen and uh, how some folks um, can uh, 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 embrace it in a much faster way than others um, who are not necessarily as digitally um, savvy or even frankly digitally native as others. Even this idea of concurrency um, that takes place with these tools. Um, yesterday I was at a, uh, a large uh, um, electronic medical records vendor location, Cerner in Kansas City, and um, uh, several of my colleagues, we were you know interspersed through the room um, while the dialogue was taking place, we were instant messaging one another back and forth with observations and questions and um, engaging. Um, and and in today's world, it's it's uh, it's it's the equivalent of note passing, except because when you look around the world, you see most of the individuals that are present um, are in front of some kind of uh, or have in front of them some kind of uh, of a device whether it's an iPad or an iPhone or a laptop, and they are taking notes. It could be because they're capturing information to go into Evernote, or in other cases, it's because they're instant messaging. And, and uh, personally, I will have um, uh, an iPhone as well as iPad, as well as I have a, um, a particular device I use. It's called LiveScribe. It actually records your pen strokes um, using a Moleskine um, old, uh, you know, handwritten uh, notepad, um, which uploads a digitally accurate version of my uh, handwritten notes, um, which I can then put into Evernote. So I, I'm, I'm in a meeting and I'm interacting with uh, no fewer than three devices personally, um, uh, cutting across what's going on in production, what's going on uh, in email and other places in the company, what's going on um, with, uh, in, my, in my particular case, uh, the CVS and Aetna dialogue that's taking place, what's happening in the meeting that I'm in, uh, and even uh, dealing with uh, personal uh, circumstances, uh, with the travel um, and, and arranging travel and pickup from, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, from the airport. So uh, the point here is, um, is in that case, uh, I was operating in a, as a re remote worker, and I was actually shifting, context shifting, um, the nature of what I was working on and flowing that across a variety of different devices. Uh, and uh, and that's, 
that's the way workers are expected to work. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest things is, is how do we manage context switching? Uh, and I think we've all had experiences where we've gone back to an iMessage um, or an SMS text stream thinking we were streaming or texting um, to uh, one recipient uh, where in fact uh, it was to another one and usually that's where you send an oops following that. But anyway, the point here is that if, if you don't have the technical capability to support the way people have become uh, used to interacting and uh, communicating, uh, it can be very challenging for you to attract and retain good talent any longer. Uh, this is probably more an issue for um, millennials and those who have grown up in a highly uh, context switching environment of interaction, whether it was because they were going across Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, or other, um, or uh, it's just the way that folks are used to working. Um, and others have, uh, they, 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 they're very challenged. Um, WebEx, for instance, uh, offers a variety of technical capabilities that gives you flexibility to either receive audio via uh, internet protocol, IP, or call you at a, a, a device, whether it's a cell phone or an IP phone or a traditional uh, wireline phone. And there are those who don't, um, the, the, the optionality introduces for them complexity and they're looking for the simplification of I want an AT&T conference number and give me my, my six digit uh, uh, code and that's it. That's all I have to worry about. This idea of understanding who has control, who's presenting what can overwhelm some individuals who are just not that technically savvy. Um, and so we have to be really cognizant of the audience as we think about these uh, technologies in the workplace. And so that really brings us to how should we be thinking about this. And for me, that's how do we align the good with the better and the bad with the easier and the ugly with the avoidable. Um, and as I alluded to, people are connecting in, in new ways. And frankly, um, even your customers are experiencing you in an omni-channel experience um, where it's not like a single channel is used to interact. Um, what you'll find is they start out in one channel could be um, through a mobile capability or the web, and then they'll, they'll, their job to be done, they'll seek to complete in another channel. It could be through a face-to-face, -face, it could be through um, a phone call, uh, but it's this idea of my job to be done, my task at hand, I start in one place and I carry and complete it through another, and it isn't necessarily because I'm not able to satisfy myself through one channel. I I tend to move my way through these channels based on my personal preferences. I know when I uh, sit at home and watch a movie anymore, I usually have an iPad or an iPhone and I'm on Wikipedia or IMDB and looking up information about uh, actors and uh, their background and who they are and what other things I've seen them in. We've, we, we've become accustomed to this omni-channel experience and having the ability to offer that to customers um, is critical and having a workforce who is capable of, of doing that themselves is also critical to delivering that um, ease of use experience. At any rate, we have to think about um, how we manage things in these new ways, how we think differently about the behavioral controls, how we think differently about outcomes, and even uh, how we look at managing people. And so um, what you'll see is that teams will tend to work in the same place, or they may work in different places, they may work at the same time, they may work at different times. Um, and I know in our, our experience, uh, we actually um, practice a follow the sun. And as a result, we have a workforce that uh, goes across um, the Bahamas, to South America, to the Philippines, to India, in some cases, uh, um, even into um, Eastern European countries. Uh, and, and so you, you oftentimes have to think about the nature of the work. One of the reasons um, that we've, um, we've got uh, uh, some workforce contingent in South America uh, is because the challenge of working in an agile environment using agile techniques um, where you have scrum teams uh, have to almost work 
um, uh, synchronously. And therefore, when you have time zone differences, uh, if you can't accommodate, meaning someone in India is working through uh, uh, midnight, early morning hours to accommodate someone who's working here in the afternoon or morning hours here in the United States, um, you can be challenged. And so um, what we do is we look for talent and we align work process and practices with elements of each of these different factors, whether it's a focus around a particular skill set. One of our South American companies is a company called Globant, and we use them for a lot of our um, consumer-centric design work, mobile experience work, uh, but it also is an aid in that it it's an aligned time zone, so this, the teams, the scrum teams, can uh, can work together, um, and so technology can help that. But there's a good example of time zone differences and the implications of that if we had um, if we had been pursuing agile techniques with a a team that was uh, located in India, um, typically in order to, because of the nature of the work, um, whether it's paired programming or extreme programming in nature, there are elements that require them to work synchronously or at the same time. doesn't have to be in the same place, but again, these are factors that you have to think about um, as you uh, leverage and use technology. Certain technologies are better than others um, around facilitating that. And in our case, uh, this is an asynchronous course. And so we're using technologies um, like um, uh, video recording with integration to presentation um, 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 uh, capabilities so that uh, you can see the presentation synced up with the video, but you don't have to be physically observing it at the time that I'm, I'm giving the lecture. Uh, it does make it a little challenging, which is why we're using discussion boards um, to help with questions that you all may have um, around the particular lectures, um, which means that I asynchronously will go in and review the discussion boards and read those and look for opportunity to respond. Um, so the technology helps enable that, but it isn't necessarily specifically defined for asynchronous experiences. Um, on the other hand, uh, it helps. Email is probably the great example of that. Uh, some may think email is a is a communication tool. Um, frankly, most of my use of it is as a, a work for a workflow management or a task management tool. It's to take a task, to assign it to an individual, um, as opposed to to communicate status or information um, around uh, how something is going on. So again, the technologies are used um, for, in some cases, things that they weren't originally intended to be used for. I like to use the phrase, water will seek its own level. Um, and these are things that you have to be very cognizant of as you introduce new technologies into the workforce because they will be used in unintended ways. And that is one of the ways that um, a friction can be introduced into processes. Uh, you can design friction explicitly. You can put something in the work process for the purpose of stopping, impeding, slowing progress because you want to make sure that something is right, a, a decision is made, or um, that you have an opportunity to change the outcome of how a process is executing. Some cases you introduce friction just because you're introducing change. In other cases, you introduce friction unintentionally because the technology is used in unexpected and unanticipated ways. And so as you design processes, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about this, and as you introduce technology into the workplace, you have to always be cognizant of uh, there may be unintended use, which is good, but there could also be unintended use, which is uh, bad. So um, how do we think about um, this idea of a technology-enabled workforce and how we think about performance management. And so it creates new opportunities, but these tend to um, shift your focus. So um, traditionally, uh, management used to have this philosophy of management by walking around. And all that means is um, to see who was working and who wasn't, you would get up, you'd leave your office, and you'd go walk the floor, um, and you would observe 
uh, the interactions and what was taking place. And it was through direct observation that conclusions around performance would be drawn and then com conveyed. Oftentimes, this was done on an individual by individual basis uh, because it was, it was not as easy to understand the aggregate output of the team. You could understand um, how the team was performing overall, but your ability to gain insight into how the individual elements of the team work was challenged because that would require you to have the ability to physically observe um, the aggregate um, performance of the team and then be able to discern which entities were performing and contributing and, and what, which weren't. And then obviously hiring um, was done through dialogue with HR and then you would bring someone in and frequently um, you didn't give a lot of consideration to technology savviness. Now if you think about in today's world, um, you very often have, uh, because of the nature of the way a process is automated, you have the direct purpose of the process automation, but you also have the exhaust off of the process. And the exhaust can give you insight into um, how, how well an individual is performing. Um, not that it's a good example, but uh, in source code management, um, in order to avoid conflicts where you may have uh, two developers making changes to a particular part of a program at the same time, uh, you will check it in and check it out. And so if you think about it, that makes really good sense. If, uh, if I want to make a change, I check it out. I make my changes and I check it back in. If another programmer needs to, to modify that code, they'll check it out and then they'll check it back in. Again, that's the intended purpose of that. Now, if you think about it, you have the ability to branch, look at the branches, because what happens when you check it out, it's noted where it was, and it will then version it on the place when it gets checked back in. And you'll have the ability to determine when was it checked out, when was it checked back in, and you can look at and compare what are the differences. So in essence, the exhaust, I'm not saying that this is, a, again, I'm using this to be illustrative. The exhaust in this case is you could actually determine what level of change was done to the program, and you could determine how long that program was checked out before it was checked in, and you could impute a certain level of productivity um, around that individual. And you never would have to go and observe them. You simply could use the exhaust of um, the metadata, it's data about the data um, of these workflow-based systems that are used or tools that are used today. And in, in, in my job, um, very frequently, um, we are asked about a variety of things um, and uh, we may get someone who says a particular thing happened and we will go and look at systems logs and we're able to discern um, some very, uh, very detailed information about um, what actions were being taken, when, by whom, what time. And so um, there are times where this information is used um, to understand how the performance of an individual is progressing. Um, and so uh, you just have to be cognizant in a technology-enabled world that a lot of these actions and things that are taken often find their way into some form of system log, audit logs, and, um, and will become more and more ingrained in performance management systems. Um, if you think about it, um, piece rate is a, is a form of uh, compensation where you compensate someone for uh, producing a particular unit of work. Uh, many reward systems are built into that because that, that's a reflection of individual productivity balanced with the quality of the work that's been done. And the more that these processes become automated, the more information that you'll be able to glean and leverage and use. And frequently, what happens is um, you, you, because not all work is created the same necessarily, the example in, in, I gave around programming, making a change to a simple uh, module in the program is not the same as making a change into something that's very complex. Um, and therefore, you have, to, you have to think about those things. But frequently, um, you begin to look at productivity and incentive mechanisms more team-based um, around output as opposed to the individual. Uh, I know that in my particular case, um, we use in our development and support organizations, our engineering uh, space, 
um, a particular uh, measure of productivity called function point analysis. Um, and while we could and do uh, track that at an individual level, all our compensation systems are built around team-based uh, productivity, um, primarily because of at some level it becomes extremely difficult to understand the nature of the work that a particular a programmer, developer, or engineer is working on compared to another because you have varying skill sets and the complexity of the work itself uh, varies. At any rate, my point is um, that performance is often measured based on the exhaust of uh, technology enabled work processes. There's a shift to more operating at a team based, incentive based level, and as we think about skills. Um, more and more technology a competency is a critical part of the hiring process. So, um, what about this location of the workforce? Who does what, where, and frankly, when? And in today's world, um, generally speaking, not exclusively, but generally speaking, work can be done almost anywhere and at almost any time. Now, clearly, um, there are some areas where that's not the case. Uh, surgery might be an example of that, although as, as we get um, more and more refined around technology-assisted surgery um, and you have uh, surgeon-controlled um, robotic capabilities, uh, if the surgeon is in the next room um, and is able to perform a particular procedure that way safely, then the surgeon likely can be located in a distant space. Um, we see this with drones and uh, the ability to pilot drones. Um, so this, this idea of having to be physically present um, may not be the case. Now, um, time-wise, uh, it may be based sheer, sheerly on the nature of the task to be formed, but if the task can be performed in an asynchronous way, there's no reason why it, uh, it can't be done. Um, so as we think about this, we have to understand in today's world, not unlike I talked about with the experience-based economy and the fact that um, individuals have come to expect a particular experience as they consume products and services, um, workers are doing the same thing in the work context. And they're looking for a lot uh, more flexibility, which means a move toward more working from home. and. Um, and enabling a mobile workforce where they can work from a variety of locations. Uh, and this idea of where the workplace is, is it's more turning into where you can get your work done and then how the technology helps enable that dictates more the where it can get done, uh, not that it has to be done physically in an office space uh, because the tools allow the observation, the exhaust to be used in terms of performance management the tools allow access to what is necessary for the individual to get their job done. And therefore, frequently any longer, the technology that is needed the most to determine that is really about connectivity. Um, and in some cases, the tools have even um, been built to allow uh, you to uh, grab a chunk of work, be disconnected, do your work, connect back, transfer it back and forth. Um, and uh, in, in our particular case, we have a mobile workforce, um, remote workers, and uh, we um, have technology enabled them to go into the home as part of the uh, selling process. And they can um, capture all the requisite information, go back to the office or um, uh, connect after the visit in the home uh, and then exchange information, which can result in an enrollment. Uh, we technology enabled our uh, care caregiver um, workforce who go in and deliver care in the homes, uh, very similar kinds of technology um, where they could be real time connected or uh, they can um, synchronize the information necessary so that in the in the home they can interact uh, with a, a member or a patient, get back into their vehicle, connect exchange information, do the same from within the office. And again, it's this idea of um, enabling them to get this work done and facilitating even a disconnected, um, connected environment, if you will. 
And then clearly, um, virtual teams um, are a natural extension of um, remote workers. And then you have these hybrids where some will work in the office and some will be on the road and remote. And you have an experience through a technology such as WebEx where it, it creates the appearance that you're uh, more physically co-located. Now, there are some things to consider as you think about this. Um, one of the things is, um, I've already alluded to this, knowledge workers have a high degree of flexibility um, because uh, today's technologies allow you to become uncoupled from a specific physical workspace. Clearly, um, individuals are changing in their lifestyles and their expectations, and so um, that's leading toward a desire to want to have a lot of geographical flexibility and time shift flexibility, uh, new technologies, uh, and I, I referred to this when I talked about connectivity and the increasing bandwidth creates a high degree of optionality. Um, if you want to think about this, there are, as an example, um, there are radiologists in India, in some cases, um, who are um, uh, serving as um, radiologists for um, scans and reads of uh, CT scans. Uh, and so if you think about the idea of imaging and sharing images, there's a lot of information and data that's being transmitted. Uh, and even in the uh, wireless space, high levels of bandwidth um, have been achieved and will continue to increase in bandwidth over time. And so um, we will find ourselves in a much more highly connected workplace, capturing significant amounts of information and data that will be shared uh, synchronously and asynchronously, whether it's in-home remote monitoring or monitoring of your, um, your uh, car. Uh, I know my wife and daughter through um, State Farm have these little devices installed for the purposes of obtaining a, a discount on insurance, and they have conversations anymore about their grading on braking and acceleration and other things. And it's, I find it very interesting how how they step into this and they're, they are giving up, in essence, significant amounts of personal information um, for the purposes of obtaining, in, in my daughter's case, it was a $30 discount and there was a conversation that a $5 a month discount seems pretty good. Um, and, uh, and it's this idea of how connected we are. And if we think about how the workforce um, is being trained by those things. That's, that's the consequence of this. A lot of, again, it's, uh, it's called web ubiquity in the, on the slide, but it's really this idea of a highly connected and interconnected world that's uh, on all the time. And then clearly there's a lot to be said for green concerns, which is uh, lowering the carbon footprint in the United States, um, which means fewer buildings, um, which means, frankly, not just good things for the environment, but a lower real estate costs for companies. So there are very clear advantages, uh, but there are some things to keep in mind. Um, while uh, you get reduced stress and increased productivity, from a work perspective, there are times where it introduces challenges at the home. I, I am perhaps one of the worst around that. Uh, I may be sitting on the back porch, and you saw me reference because I'm I'm uh, recording these lectures in my basement, um, and uh, uh, so I'll be on the back porch uh, on a Friday night having a, uh, a, a a drink with my wife, and uh, I'll out of more habit than anything else, I'll pick up and I'll look at something, and I'll I'll realize something is happening or um, has happened. And it's not that it's an urgent thing that requires my attention. It's again, it's a habit. Uh, you may have heard people refer to back in the days when Blackberry um, was, was dominant, they referred to these kinds of things as crackberries. So it becomes more and more difficult to separate your personal life from professional. Um, there are uh, challenges around um, fulsomely evaluating performance. There may be some issues that individuals feel because of isolation. I, um, many, many years ago, this goes back 20 years before I joined Humana, had an associate who was um, 
had some personal issues um, and felt isolated and disconnected um, from work because uh, they, they, while they worked at home, uh, they were a remote worker because of the skill set um, that they possessed. And they found it very challenging to connect with society. Um, so you have to also understand if the individual and the what could be in some cases um, uh, isolation um, is is a, can be problematic for them uh, in in a in a world and we we saw this in some of our very early days of um, of remote remote workforce with uh, 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 personal nurses um, who would give telephonic care to members who worked from home uh, they struggled initially until. Um, we implemented technology that allowed them to interact. They could have their, you know, traditionally when uh, uh, nurses would arrive on the floor, they would have, I don't know the technical word for it, but it's the equivalent of a huddle. The shift that is leaving and the shift that is coming on would come together. They'd discuss patients. It was a, it was a very social experience, even though it was work-focused. And when we found uh, personal nurses, uh, because of the caregiving being telephonic and the ability to support them remotely because of some of the uh, challenges with recruiting nurses, because um, they are a scarce resource, um, that um, um, we, we accommodated that, um, uh, the flexibility of the workforce, but they lost something that they were experienced with, and that's this idea of the shift handoff um, and the huddle. Um, so we implemented technology that allowed them to, in essence, have a similar experience, but continue to do it telephonically. And we found um, that their engagement rates and the morale um, uh, climbed fairly substantially. Uh, there, there are other things I mentioned that not all jobs are suitable for um, work. And then um, clearly um, security in and of itself can be more challenging. Um, and we'll talk more about that down the road around cybersecurity. Um, I use the phrase, uh, you'll hear me, I think I used it in the last lecture at times where there's this balance of, of good opportunity and challenges that come with it. I call it the never ending battle of good versus evil and cybersecurity, the ubiquity of consumer technology and the expectation of ease of use, um, doesn't comport well with how do you deliver an enterprise experience in the same way. Um, and so cybersecurity and actions taken, um, especially when the technology hasn't matured up for it yet, uh, can, uh, can uh, lead to productivity implications. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's going to be a continual uh, journey, um, especially as new technologies um, come along uh, and the cyberspace isn't matured up yet enough to um, um, uh, support that. Um, one of the ones you may be familiar with is Slack. Slack is, is this collaboration tool that, that has this incredible way of interfacing into a variety of enterprise systems, um, but yet because it's, it's built for high degrees of collaboration, it doesn't necessarily um, sit well with um, some of the folks in uh, the uh, cybersecurity space. Uh, and so technology in that regard is going to have to uh, catch up to some of the advances in the, the consumer or user experience. So uh, virtual teams have their challenges. Um, uh, you have issues around communicating, especially as I talked about in multiple time zones. Um, e essentially, if the synchronous interaction of the virtual team is important. That's the real big challenge. I talked about technology. Um, not everybody is at the same level of technology savviness. Um, as some folks are pretty good at using AT&T uh, teleconferencing, but WebEx and how to think about and interact with the variety of optionality there um, can overwhelm them quickly. And so there, um, what, what uh, when you shift, for instance, just use this to be illustrative, from the web-based experience of WebEx versus the iPhone or iPad-based experience, the user platform 
uh, because of the need to keep it simple in the iPhone and iPad, whereas it's easier to be a little bit more complicated in the, in the web space, um, allows us to shift those who are probably a little bit overwhelmed um, with trying to understand in the web space to an iPhone or iPad experience, which is a lot simpler because it simply says join. Um, and they can become part of the experience, engage in the video, see the presentation, and they only have to push um, a, uh, a, a, the join button in order to do that. And then um, clearly um, you have a higher degree of diversity um, with virtual teams which can be challenging. I talked uh, last uh, lecture about culture and even the fact that you have geographically distributed groups collaborating as virtual teams can introduce a dynamic around cultural differences that you might not normally get by the nature of traditional work where it was co-located uh, teams more out of the physical aspects of the environment and the way work got done versus today's, which is a highly distributed, highly um, um, virtualized workforce. Now, change is really the only constant. And how do you think about change management is very important when you're into introducing new technology into a workforce. Um, and change very often is a major concern for employees. Um, and it's very possible that those changes will be resisted uh, because it tends to upset the norm. Um, interestingly enough, we tend to see um, these um, water seeks its own level um, where it becomes highly predictable. And predictability, generally speaking, when you look at a workforce, is a soothing factor. And so when you change something by introducing technology, you have to absolutely consider the other levers of people and process um, and the implications that technology will have on that and then address those. And, and folks can resist in a variety of ways. Um, they can, I, I simplify it um, personally into, um, you will see it either as uh, they wait you out or they wear you down. Um, and so waiting you out is they just, they just do not engage. Um, they may not actually, if you introduce new technology, they just may not use it. And if you are trying to shift them from an existing technology to the new technology, and part of the business case for the new technology is you're going to eliminate the cost associated with the old technology, that can be extremely challenging when the new technology remains available. So how do you combat that? you don't give them a choice. You take the old technology away. Then what happens? You can have situations where they deny it's working, even though it is working. Uh, they may directly sabotage it. You, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the norm, but there are cases where individuals will um, pay less attention to the inputs that they're making. Sometimes you'll see this um, even when you're in testing, uh, there's a phrase called guerrilla testing, um, where they are actively attempting to break, which can be a good thing if you're doing that for the purposes of proactively identifying issues as opposed to um, passively and aggressively um, trying to fight or resist uh, the introduction of technology. Uh, they could challenge the value of the technology. Um, they can uh, propose alternatives um, to it. Um, and that can make it extremely difficult for you, especially if um, you are attempting to, um, as I said, move from one technology base to another. Uh, and then likewise, they could just refuse to use it. And so what you need to do as you think about these technology changes is think about Levine's model, which is first you, people, as I said, people and they, they, they drive toward predictability. It makes their understanding of the world easier. And the first thing you have to do is understand motives. And then you have to do what's called unfreeze them. You have to demonstrate to them why the change is better, um, in what way it will touch on a fundamental need they have, it will make things better for them. It's the, it's the old, you know, whiff them, what's in it for me. 
then you have to move them. And frequently, this is um, accomplished through uh, training or otherwise exposing them to how this, this is done, in what way is it different, and you bring them through a change, and then you have to refreeze them. And very frequently, that's done through some form of an incentive structure um, that reinforces the desired behavior and no longer reinforces the undesired behavior. And so I won't go through Cotter's steps, um, but what you will see oftentimes in good change management is the early adopters are the ones who get the recognition. They are used as the stellar example, and they are very frequently um, um, pointed out to, if you will, all aspects of the organization. Again, the, the implied message is, if you adopt, you will be seen in the same light. And again, it gets back to a, a, a dual message of, here's why this is good, and here's what happens to those who adopt what is good, and you provide the mechanism for them to be able to make the transition, whether it's through training, or access to the tools, or others. Um, but you, you have to start with motivating them, you have to then have the ability to move them, and you have to have the ability to refreeze them, and frequently the refreezing is where you'll see a lot of the rewards, recognition, and incentive basis uh, behind that. So now let me shift a little bit to um, process uh, processes. And um, I brought this slide back from the first lecture. Uh, in that, it was more of a conversation around organizational de design options. But you'll recall that um, I used it to convey for me a very important message around the currency of ease of use and information as a currency as well in this new experience-based economy. When you tend to look at organizational structures based on the traditional hierarchy of the management team and the functions and the um, operations of the business, typically you go there with the mind toward or an eye toward how does one optimize that. That's really how do you focus on cost, more or less. Process, you can have a focus on cost, but cost is more the byproduct of the true focus. And the true focus needs to be around understanding the experience that you are delivering. Because it's through the processes of an enterprise that the customer experiences um, the enterprise's products and services. And, and as a result, as we think about perspective, I will continue to encourage you to keep first and foremost, if you are going to compete successfully in an experience-based economy, and if you buy into ease of use as a currency and information as a currency, you must start with the consumer and work back, which means you have to start with the processes of the organization, not the processes of the sales organization, because those are things that exist for the purposes of managing an organization as a function or as a part of a function like a department. This is really around the cross-functional processes of the organization that your consumers experience. So in that regard, as we talk about process, that's the overarching picture to keep in mind, especially as we think about um, introducing technology. And I, and I use this phrase, and, um, and that is, Start with the customer and work back. If you are only looking at your space, at your function, then you are, you are likely to be designing something that is more for you than it is for the customer. Now, you may have the customer's good intentions um, uh, in, at the front of your mind, but at the end of the day, um, your process and your function is very likely dependent on other Inter interfacing functions in order to get the job to be done that the customer truly wants done. And you could then have inherent inefficiencies, uh, redundancies, or friction points that they will experience that are more your challenge and how you've interfaced a departmental level process to another departmental level process to another. And frequently, 
If you want to go to a call center environment, you will see this in the form of transfers, call transfers, where I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Let me get you to. Um, because frequently, um, you will find that problem resolution or inquiry processes in companies will be defined by the product or the specific service. And the fact of the matter is, when a person calls, um, oftentimes they are looking to interface with you about perhaps multiple products um, or a service that affects or is affected by the products that they, they purchased from you. And you'll see that's why customer relationship management, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, is a technology that, it, that strives to bring uh, the functional experiences together by looking at these things as cross-functional processes that a customer um, will experience. So you must think about this as who is the customer of the process? What's the nature of the experience you want? What is it that their requirements are? This is the thing I refer to as what is the job to be done? Um, and oftentimes um, they cannot necessarily articulate it, which is why you have to observe them in their natural habitat. You go out and watch, just like the example I gave with McDonald's, and you see what is being done. And then you seek to understand in the, in the, in the, in the environment that they're using the product, what are they doing? And then you begin to see the insights between their intended job to be done and how they're using the product or service to do that. And then you look at these things and you ask yourself, is it making that better? Is it immaterial or does it make it worse? And what you really want to do is eliminate the immaterial and the worse things. And then what you're doing is you're adding value to the experience that the individual has. And then what you want to do is technology enable that. So there are different ways that one can think about it. And as, as, as true to form, and I've alluded to this, um, much or often what happens is organizations are, they are living, breathing entities. And um, what you find is um, academicians will go and observe them, and then they will construct frameworks to explain the behaviors they see. But keep in mind, these are, these are strictly frameworks. Um, they are not, uh, it's not as crystal clear as, as one would see. In other words, it isn't always that you have radical process change or incremental. Oftentimes that gets back to the nature of the change, how exhaustive it is. Um, is it a series of changes? Um, it's this idea of evolution versus revolution. Um, so radical process change, which uh, the textbook refers to as business process reengineering is more revolutionary. This is where, um, in essence, you look at what is happening and you, you start with the mindset that we need to blow it up and we need to create it from the beginning. Um, incremental process design, which they've labeled total quality management, is more evolutionary. In other words, we, we are making fine tunings along the way to get to a better outcome. And so frequently, because, because of that, I talked about change, and I talked about that folks become comfortable in a bubble of predictability, um, that when you look at incremental, it's not quite, it doesn't push them as far. And a great example of this is when we think about how a salesperson gains entry um, in, a, in a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, selling you something. It starts out with a simple ask. And then there's another one, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. And at some point, you get to a point where um, you've made a decision to purchase the product. You probably didn't start there. You probably agreed to something very simple to begin with. And then additional um, uh, asks, compromises, and movement went along the way. Well, that's what happens here is, is individuals will tend to accept smaller changes um, over time, producing a larger change, not with the realization that that has actually happened. And Six Sigma is a popular approach, and Six Sigma gets to this idea that um, if you think about an error rate, and you think about an error rate, good, good things, bad things, and you look on the bad side, and you say, well, here are 
here's the probability of, of having an error producing something or doing something a million times. You get something on the order of 3.4 errors per million. And that's six sigma. Sigma reflects the uh, degrees of standard deviation um, from the mean uh, in order to get to that way out far space where you have uh, that level of error rate or less um, out of a million steps. Uh, process, business process reengineering is where you sit back and you, you really do have bold goals. Um, you want to get through very fast. You want to move quickly and have breakthrough thinking. I talked about you, you blow it up and you look at how do you uh, change it um, quickly as possible. And this is the one that will be met with the highest resistance because typically um, it will shift the power base um, and the value base of individuals rapidly as opposed to incrementally. And incrementally, you've heard the phrase death by a thousand duck bites. Um, well, it's a lot easier to suffer a thousand duck bites uh, than one big bite at a time. Um, and obviously, because of the nature of that high risk, high reward, you need to be extremely deliberate when you think about radical change and when to use it. So what about this, what, what about this concept of business process management systems? These, these are big, they're very comprehensive, and they can be extremely challenging. And it's, in essence, uh, a tools that enable information and, and transactional action that cut across a big swath of processes. As, as a consequence, they can be very disruptive to how work gets done, which is why they can be very challenging. But if you're on the receiving end, if you're the customer, there can be a high, high degree of reward for you if they're done right. And that's, that's the conundrum um, that most companies face when they think about uh, large-scale business process management systems. Um, and so these are very large enterprise class software applications. They can be in the cloud um, and they manifest themselves mostly as um, one of three uh, enterprise resource planning capabilities, which is typically how you think about, you know, defining a product, marketing a product, selling a product, provisioning for the product, producing the product, testing the quality of the product, and then shipping and, or distributing the product. And so technology, how does it do that? Uh, customer relationship management is now more on the customer experience side. How do we think about not getting the thing to the customer, but what things does the customer have and how do I look at that customer so that I can see what their, their total lifetime value is to me because I can deliver a differentiated experience and probably the simplest example of this, although I'm not saying that this is a, a version of customer relationship management, but conceivably it could be, is as you think about airline rewards or credit card rewards, um, it's this idea of, I understand who you are, I understand how you engage with me. The information and analytics around that is used to understand how valuable you are, and I treat you in such a way. Um, whether it's you show up at the hotel and I don't ask you what um, uh, newspaper you like to have in the morning because I already know it's a Wall Street, whether you're checking into the, the, the W in Chicago or it's in New York or San Francisco. But it's this idea that these, these um, your experience across my uh, experience boundaries are understood. I can anticipate and I can actually... Um, provide a contextualized, personalized experience uh, therein. And then supply chain management is probably the other side of it. Before the product itself is being produced, how do I make sure that the highest quality elements of the things that go into my finished good or construction of my finished good are predictably available to me at the lowest price point with the highest quality? And I lose no time in getting to market because I've integrated upstream with my supplier's value chain. Um, and so as you think about it, these capabilities can interact with hundreds of systems across a large organization. I'll give you a specific example. We've implemented Salesforce to support our customer care experience. On the, on, on the inside, and we'll hear more about this when we, think, when we talk about service-oriented architectures, um, 
supporting that interaction with Salesforce, a cloud-based vendor of a CRM capability, are 300 um, microservices uh, that connect into a variety of systems in the Humana space. So being able to do that and ensure that you have um, that high degree of reliability creates a high degree of demand on your technology environment. Why? So that you can deliver that differentiated experience. And we'll talk more uh, when we get into uh, architecture and infrastructure and those kinds of things. I, I alluded to this when I talked about uh, enterprise uh, resource planning uh, previously. It's how do we integrate these information flows in the product development, marketing, sales, um, build and delivery side of the house. Oftentimes these software packages reflect best practices around doing that. A lot of the algorithmic capabilities that will automatically um, um, look at um, uh, quality measures and metrics um, and determining those and reporting on those, they're all built. They all come pre-built um, and can be used. Therefore, you can, not cheaply so, but elevate the quality of your own processes by applying this technology. It needs to be integrated with a number of systems. I alluded to that. That's true probably more fully here than it is with uh, CRM or SCM. And then some customization is always required, uh, but you would you typically want to avoid customization uh, because uh, if it's best practice, why do you need to customize it? And in these cases, in the ERP space, um, they tend to evolve over a long period of time because of the growth. Um, the, in other words, I alluded to this, organizations are like entities and they grow and evolve over time and not, no one is like any other, even though you may have best practices built in, as you come across a new one, you may identify new best practices which become part of the package. And then these things can be very challenging to uh, keep up and remain current on. And so oftentimes um, these large packages uh, can be disruptive when you take new releases or versions. Uh, cloud, interestingly enough, has become one of the preferred ways of doing this because these, these vendors like Salesforce have built these capabilities to be highly flexible um, uh, because they're run in one place as opposed to traditional uh, packages, perhaps an Oracle where you're, you are provided the software, you then have to retrofit the software in your environment and run it in your environment. And so the installation becomes the customer's problem. If you're running it in the cloud, it's not the customer's problem, it's your problem. And therefore, you tend to, when you build these solutions, engineer that ease of upgrade into the product um, and it becomes less disruptive. And so we can typically take a Salesforce uh, release, if you will, or changes every two weeks, as opposed to, um, in some cases, just to be illustrative with Oracle, we've implemented a part of their ERP system um, to support HR and general ledger, um, although we are moving toward Workday uh, for HR. Um, it will come where we may take a release every 12 to 18 months. I've spent quite a bit of time talking about customer relationship management, but it is a way of extending the value chain that the organization has because it views the single customer across their multiple relationships with the company. Um, its focus is around obtaining, enhancing relationships with and retaining customers. And it can obviously lead to better service because best practice Capabilities tend to go across an omni-channel experience, which is built in. You'll hear about, for instance, Chatter, Salesforce's Chatter capability. Um, and that can lead to competitive advantage because you deliver a differentiated experience. Uh, common examples of this are Oracle, SAP, and Salesforce. And Oracle and SAP both integrate um, their customer relationship management into their um, enterprise resource planning systems. Uh, supply chain management is moving uh, interoperability and connectedness back and through the value system 
Uh, you may recall that organizational design from the last lecture. And the intention here is to integrate across the supply chain where companies' processes are linked. So I may be dependent on a supplier for a particular part. I, I alluded to this in the second lecture. And I may have an automatic reorder point based on um, my rate of productivity, how many units I need to or can produce in a, per, a particular period of time will determine how long I can go in producing something before I run out of a part because it's an inventory. And rather than carry the, an inventory and get to a point where there's a reorder, I carry it to a point where I know the lead time on getting this part is two days and I have enough inventory to last me two days. So I trigger a reorder and I may auction off that um, based on the in the moment cost and quality factors for a variety of, of suppliers in that connected ecosystem, the supply chain space. And I may not order from the same supplier, but because of their quality and their reliability, I'm able to keep my inventory levels low, which lowers my handling costs, inventory carrying costs. Um, and it makes me cheaper, and if I'm cheaper and can produce a higher quality product, I can be more competitive. And so it, just as I said, it optimizes costs and opportunities for the companies in the supply chain. Um, and it allows folks to understand in the chain what are the latest, what's the latest information about sales that are expected in inventories, because frankly, those are the things that fuel the manufacturing process. Um, and uh, it allows uh, material will be to source from all stages of, um, of delivery. Now, this can be a double-edged sword. Obviously, I've alluded to many of these. Um, it represents a variety of best practices because they are embedded in these uh, software solutions. Um, it allows different parts of the organization that are functionally aligned to communicate automatically because that uh, communication, if you will, is built into the process-oriented view of these uh, technologies. Um, it does allow you to see a bigger picture in a central way, and therefore you can centralize decision-making more than decentralize it, and which optimizes more. Clearly, you don't have one area taking reports from another area and rekeying things because information flows across the process, which cuts across these traditionally uh, siloed operating areas. Um, and you can um, drive a higher degree of standardization across diverse locations. Uh, disadvantages are implementing an ERP or implementing um, an SCM or implementing um, CRM um, is a lot of work. Um, there is a lot of change. There is a lot of, of process implications and there's a lot of technology. So it's a lot of work across the stack of people processing technology. Um, you may have to redesign business practices to get the biggest benefit. This goes back to seek to customize only where there's strategic differentiation because um, otherwise you're customizing everything and you're taking a tool and you're building it to a suboptimized set of processes. Uh, they can be very costly. Oftentimes they're sold as a suite, although the market demands are driving that to change um, as of late. Uh, you may have to bring the organization around it as opposed to um, uh, through the organization. And then um, there are a lot of um, uh, failures um, that have been described along the way trying to uh, do this at large scale for large companies, especially companies, for instance, I talked about the standardization at different locations. There are some companies that um, may have 17 or 20 SAP implementations across the globe who have been striving for years to get to a single implementation for the benefit of consistency and standardization uh, and have failed. Um, so there are a lot of failures um, in this space. So how to think about this? Well, um, enterprise systems should drive um, a business process redesign primarily when you are just starting out. When you really have nothing, taking something that's in the box and following it 
um, is usually one of the quickest and easiest things to do. You'll, you'll hear me talk about this, the pyramid of architecture is the base of it. It's your organizing principle. What then sits on top of your architecture are your processes. How do you integrate across the building blocks that form the foundation of what you do? And then you have methods. These are the specific steps you take within a process. And then you apply tools. And all too often when technology is chosen, there's a tendency to, to become enamored with the tool. And you don't think about the fundamental changes it will have on the way in which people do the work, the processes followed, and even the fundamental architecture um, that you've chosen to pursue. And this is where you start to get cultural issues and implications. So this idea of the pyramid you'll hear more about. My point is, when you don't have something that forms the basis of what you do because you're just starting out, the tool can help you envision and create the underlying architecture processes and methods by which you do what you do. If, if what you're doing is really not a strategic advantage and you can gain standardization and cost effectiveness and efficiency by implementing it, that's a good, that's a good candidate. And then obviously if the technology that's supporting what you're doing is having problems today, um, these, these can be avenues for without trying to uh, fix what you have. And again, go back to my phrase, sometimes when you think about business process redesign, you start by blowing things up. It's not just the processes. If the systems are blowing up, it's, it, there are times to consider it as well, because that can be a solution there. Um, where might it be inappropriate? Well, obviously, if you have a process, business process, that gives you strategic advantage, why would you want to adopt industry best practice? Wouldn't that bring you down to the same place your competitors are? So you might not consider doing that. Now, you have to be careful, because this gets to where you can have resistors who will basically say, well, wait a minute, this thing I have gives me this competitive advantage. Why do I want to replace it with that? You have to work your way through this. Um, oftentimes when this happens, you'll see this when two organizations are coming together and they are disputing whose underlying system or technology is better. And it can lead to analysis paralysis and and horrible sub-optimization over time for entities, organizations that cannot break that. And if those are both bespoke, meaning they're homegrown, it can be even worse because the sheer sense of ownership creates the belief that something has a strategic advantage. In fact, it may not, um, which is very oftentimes why third parties are brought in to help with those evaluations. I know in our case, when we went with Salesforce, we had a bespoke system that supported our customer care um, space. And we, we, um, we brought a third party in to understand the, um, the state of the art, the realm of the possible, and to help us understand, would it be better to take what we have and progress forward um, or to start with um, something like Salesforce? And in our particular case, um, we concluded that um, Salesforce gave us an advantage in the way in which we were planning to use it um, that would allow us a uh, competitive advantage that we wouldn't as, as have as easily gotten to with the bespoke solution that we had. And to this day, we are using Salesforce in ways um, that are probably um, leading, I shouldn't say probably, are leading with respect to other uh, customers in the Salesforce space. Um, again, uh, the package may not fit the organization. That's entirely possible. And clearly, if you don't have top management support in what's happening, you are really probably challenged because these will have high visibility. Um, they will be very costly. And if you don't have that upper uh, management uh, engagement and support, you may find yourself uh, facing a detractor at some point in time. So with that, uh, I'd like to close up this week's lecture and uh, thank you. And I will uh, continue to be uh, uh, looking across the discussion forums uh, for any questions you may have and bringing those uh, to this group as, uh, as I encounter them. So thank you once again for uh, your attention in this, the third lecture 
Uh, and uh, please, I hope you go have um, a, uh, a good rest of the day. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I'll see you in a week.